Howdy folks and welcome to the Hillbilly Kitchen. Today we're making Joe's cake. Now this is an absolutely delicious chocolate cake, probably the best chocolate cake I've ever eaten. And this recipe has been passed down in my dad's side of the family for four generations now, going on five. And my dad and his brothers grew up in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, which is a far piece from where I grew up and where my mama was from. But uh, they had a different life they grew up on the banks of the Delaware River. And Joe was short for Josephine. Josephine and Stan lived right next door to them and they were very good friends. Josephine and Stan had no children. So they kind of took my dad and his brothers in and they treated them like their own children. And my Uncle Chris was especially close to them. And I actually got this recipe from my Aunt Paula. And my Uncle Chris told me the story about the Great Flood uh, in 1955 in Phillipsburg when the Delaware River actually swept their houses away. Stan and Josephine's and my grandparents' house. The house that my dad and his brothers lived in. So my Uncle Chris said that the water was literally almost up to the table and he remembers swimming in to Josephine's house and she had one of these cakes in her refrigerator he, she, he said all the lights were still on the power was still on the refrigerator was still running she took the cake out of the refrigerator and sliced it and they all had a piece of Joe's cake and then swam back out of the house and watched the river sweep the houses away as they got back on land. Now, today we'd say, how in the world is that possible? Well, you have to remember that was when electricity was new and it had been added to the houses and all the electricity was coming through the ceiling. All the lights were on the ceiling. The plugs were all up very, very high because they didn't fish them through the wall. And the condenser was on top of the refrigerator. So even though the water was, you know, waist deep almost already, it wasn't up where the power was. So that's how they still had power in the house. And this cake is almost worth risking your life for a piece of it. And I wish I had my Uncle Chris telling you that story because it's much better than I tell it. But I hope that Joe's cake will become a tradition in your family like it has been in ours. The ingredients are very simple. There are a few, but it's stuff that you probably already have. I have two cups of plain flour. You want plain, not self-rising. Uh, and I do use unbleached. You can use cake flour in this if you want to. The less processed, the healthier, the more processed, the more like a cake mix it's gonna take taste. But this one, I mean, this cake recipe, if you mix it up correctly, it is just super moist, it's super rich, it's fluffy, so plain flour works great. I have a whole cup of cocoa. I have a cup of cold coffee, a cup of milk, a cup of oil. You want a cup and a half to two cups of sugar. Keep in mind, it is a cake. It's a dessert, so it's gonna have some sugar in it. I have two teaspoons of baking powder. I've got two teaspoons of vanilla. You want good vanilla, I'm using Vanilla Feeds tomorrow. If you haven't ordered your Vanilla Feeds tomorrow already, all of the proceeds go to feed hungry people in East Tennessee. And it's a nonprofit company. It's run by a young man who is only 16 years old and he has literally provided hundreds of thousands of meals now. And anytime you purchase this, he buys the vanilla beans from missionaries in Madagascar and it's just really, really good quality. So I'm gonna put a link to this, but if you're watching on a smartphone, or I mean a smart TV where you can't get the link in the description, you can Google Vanilla Feeds Tomorrow and find it. You need two teaspoons of that. Uh, I've got a teaspoon of salt and two teaspoons of baking soda. Two of baking soda, two of baking powder. And I have three eggs, if I didn't do that already. 
So I'm going to start by combining some of this stuff and moving some of it out of the way. Now, one of the secrets I was told to this cake was make sure you do not over mix it. Oh, and I've got some frost in here too, but we're going to do that recipe in the next video. So I'm going to sift all of my dry ingredients and I'm going to start with my cocoa and then I'm going to add my sugar and what that's going to do is my sugar is going to force my cocoa through there so that I don't have any lumps. And I'm going to add my baking soda and my salt. And I'm going to save my baking powder. Now, this saving the baking powder is something that I saw recently and I tried it and it's one of those tips you're going to want to hang on to. Whenever you are baking something, save your baking powder until the end of the recipe. So let me get a little bit of this through here. So I got some room. Go ahead and add your flour in. If you've got a small sifter, you know, you'll have to sift some before you can add it all. This one comes pretty close to holding it all. Now, you don't necessarily have to sift it, but if you sift it, what that does is it puts some air in it, which is gonna make your cake lighter, and it takes out all the lumps in your flour, in your cocoa, in your sugar, and it kind of gives you that texture of cake flour without having it overly processed. And you can see there, even starting with the cocoa, I'm still going to end up with some cocoa in my sifter at the end. And I want to get as much of that out as possible. But we're not going to go crazy with it because I didn't measure that close anyway. We got most of it. Okay. Now that I've got my dry ingredients, or yeah, my dry ingredients sifted together, except for my baking powder, I'm going to whisk up my eggs. You can also, when you're making homemade cakes, you can separate your eggs and you can whip your egg whites to peaks and then fold them in once you get the rest of the cake ingredients mixed up. And that will make your cakes a little bit lighter. Um, I'm not doing that today because like I said, I think these steps make this cake just about perfect, the texture of it. I mean, I just don't think you could make it much better. Okay, once you get your eggs beat up there a little bit, you can go ahead and add your oil and your vanilla. And there's no particular order to this. And your coffee. And your milk. Now this is going to be a very wet cake, obviously, because that's a lot of wet ingredients. And I'm going to mix that all together. All right. Now, I'm just going to add my wet into my dry. Well, I'm going to whisk my dry just a tad, tad bit first. And then just add it in here. You can use an electric mixer for this, but you want to make sure not to over mix it. Over mixing this cake will actually cause it to fall. Um, and that was one of the things that my Aunt Paula warned me about when she gave me the recipe. Um, she said, you definitely don't want to over mix this one. So I have just been mixing it with a whisk anytime I make it. I don't even get the electric mixer out because there's way less chance of over mixing it with a whisk than there is if you're beating it with an electric mixer. If you do use an electric mixer though, don't go above medium and don't mix for over two minutes. Now you wanna preheat your oven to 350 degrees to bake this, which is about what you use for every cake I've ever baked. 
Sometimes if you're doing a big pound cake, you start it hotter and then turn the oven down. But 350 degrees is about what you want to bake this at. And you want to bake it for 30 to 35 minutes, depending on the pan you're using. Usually, this is baked in a sheet cake and just frosted, not decorated particularly fancy. Because it's one of those cakes that you can just make to have dessert. You know, you don't have to decorate it fancy. You don't have to do it in layers and stack it or any of that stuff. Just a sheet cake and frost it. Now I'm going to add my baking powder. And just mix that in. And I'm not sure how this works, but I'm a believer in holding it. Um, I've tried it just a few times after I saw the tip somewhere and I don't remember where I saw it or who told it to me. But that's a new one on me. And I promise you, it makes a difference. And that's really all there is to it because like I said, you don't want to over mix it. Now I am going to, before I pour it out, kind of stir it just a little bit with my spatula spoon here. Make sure I don't have anything stuck in the bottom. Now, normally, like I said, this would be, you could make this in just a cake pan, you know, the 11, 9 by 11 or 11 by 13 or whatever it is, you know, the rectangle cake pan. And <clears throat> that's how I would do it normally. But if you want to bake it for Christmas or Thanksgiving to take somewhere and do the three layers and frosting in between it, that's perfectly fine. You can do it two layers or three layers, whatever. If you're going to do it in layers, measure it or use a scale. Um, I've actually got this mixed up in a measuring cup. It's seven cups. And you could do it uh, just by measuring it. But you can also use a scale. And I've done this a couple of times. So you're going to want a little over a pound of batter in each pan to have your layers even. And you can also get the little disposable cake pans and you can bake it in those um, if you want to share it. And I'm going to share some of this. I'm going to send some of it home with Alex. And I have a friend who is in the hospital, Miss Jones. If you're watching this, you've got some coming to you. And if y'all have time to say an extra prayer or two, I would appreciate you remembering Miss Jones in your prayers, and I'm sure she would too. She's been in the hospital for a while, and she's pretty feeling pretty bad. So I'm going to take one of these that I've got over here to her. Also, if you want to take it, you know, to church, a church dinner or office party or something like that around the holidays, the disposable pans are kind of a good idea because you don't have to get your pan back. Or if you just wanted to make it and divide it up into three parts and give it away to people you work with, that's a good idea too. <clears throat> and you can use the disposable pans. Anyway, we're going to put this in a 350 degree oven for about 35 minutes. Now, in 35 minutes, it's done, and miraculously, it has gone from the round pans that we put it in into these little square pans. This is what I was talking about, disposable pans that you can bake cakes in around the holidays and stuff. Um, you could even sell these for extra money around Christmas time because lots of folks don't have time to bake, and they will pay good money for a good quality homemade cake from scratch. And this is a good quality, good recipe right here. And you can get these little pans with the lids. Uh, I got two of them at the Dollar Tree for $1.25. You know, everything's went up. If you bake it in these pans, though, don't just put these thin metal pans in your oven because what will happen is the bottom will burn before your cake gets done. Put them on a cookie sheet and then put them in the oven. And the thicker cookie sheet will protect your pan. And I use my older cookie sheets for this. I save my old cookie sheets when I get new ones because sometimes if you get a little on it or something, it'll burn your cookie sheet and mess it up. So just save your old cookie sheets for this job. 
or use a good cookie sheet. I don't care. <clears throat> so these three are all going to get given away. Folks ask what I do with it. I said, Toots, this one's coming to you. <laughs> and in the next video that we're going to do, we're going to do the recipe for this absolutely delicious, indulgent, creamy chocolate frosting here that is the perfect mate to Joe's cake. And we're going to stack the three layers that we just put in the oven. And I'm going to show you how to stack a cake and frost it and put a little border around it and stuff if you want to do something a little bit fancier for the holidays. And if you do it in a pan like this, it is perfectly acceptable to just frost it and put the lid on and take it and share it. I promise you, ain't too many people going to be interested in how this looks once they taste it. You do want to let your cakes cool before you frost them. Otherwise, your frosting will melt. And this frosting um, is really simple. It only has a few ingredients, nothing special to buy. And like I said, we're going to do that, though, in the next video. And we'll kind of show you how to put an edge on it and stuff like that. My Aunt Dot used to do when she'd bake cakes, she always did sheet cakes, and she always just frosted them with a knife. But she would take her knife and just kind of do some little swirls in the top rather than smooth it out. And I know nowadays, if you buy a cake, it's always got this super smooth top on it. But my Aunt Dot always did a little swirl like this, and she just went all across the cake with the top of the cake with a butter knife. She didn't have no special tools or nothing. And I promise you, I ain't ate a better tasting cake than them with the little swirls on the top. And she just fluffed it up a little bit. And that's all she did. And this one's ready to go to Miss Jones and said the rest of these will be given away and then in the next video we'll take that three layer one and we're gonna frost it and decorate it and give you this chocolate frosting recipe here so you can have it to share with your friends and give some away or maybe take to a special holiday dinner or even make it your holiday dinner i've already made two of these for birthday cakes in the last month since i got this recipe from my aunt paula so these are a delicious birthday cake <laughs> and when you have a really good cake recipe it becomes a part of your family traditions and your family celebrations and this is certainly one of those cakes that has done this she baked my Aunt Paula baked this cake for a baby shower recently. So it's something that's continuing in a recipe, like I said, that's been passed down now for five generations almost. So I hope your family enjoys it as much as we do. And because we're entering into the season of Thanksgiving, I want to leave you with Luke 638. Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom for which the same measure that you meet with all it shall be measured to you again and that really is true how much you give determines how much is given to you and there's a lot of different philosophies that go into that but it is all through the bible that what we give, we will receive. Please keep that in mind, not just through the holiday season and this season of giving that we we're starting into now, but for every day. And when you see your brothers and sisters in need, give it because it's gonna come back to you. And I promise you there is no greater joy than to be someone else's blessing. If you truly want to feel God's love, Allow Him to use you to be someone else's blessing. There just is nothing, nothing in this world that will bring you more joy. And you will truly understand what it is to be blessed when you are able to do that for other people. I want to thank you so much for joining us in the Hillbilly Kitchen. If you haven't already, please don't forget to click like and subscribe before you leave. Share some Joe's cake with your, friend, your friends, your family, your co-workers, and share our videos too. It really helps us out. 
Until next time, remember to put God first.